a lot of people think you need either talent or hard work or luck that's a very common beliefs about if you're able to do things or not or get somewhere or learn things to do or whatever it is the thing here is that you you need to get some kind of plan and that means you need some kind of future planning and since you are doing RBIM as I'm teaching the future means that you have a future memory and with the future memory you have an experience now creating a future memory and future experience sounds like a great idea cool now you have a plan cool got a plan mm, cookies so you're thinking well cool I have a plan now what well you have to create some kind of action then right so you implement uh, action plan and you start doing things or not most people when they create for example a future memory will not take action they will have a plan some kind you know problem. but that's not the experience that's just you know what we most people call a daydream and you got well, or have some beliefs about you know that you need the more talent or uh, luck or whatever it is to you know get the plan action or get it done or achieving it for example and it's been proven I think in many ways that if you implement the experience and have a feedback to that uh, people say well, what do you mean by feedback well feedback is like you're doing things you, you mean you take action and I will show you an experience I had this student he wanted to redecorate his house he had a great house uh, I will show you a little bit of the box here with a chimney and door and a few windows so he had this idea to decorate his uh, house inside right uh, because he just bought it and uh, really great and all. so he started to plan for decoration but it never he didn't take any action because he was just you know daydreaming he was still daydreaming how it's going to be like and look like so after you know three months or six months or something like that he was still thinking about doing anything nothing happened so he uh, uh, participated in one of my workshops and and I told him to, you know, what happens if you take action? You, you, you make a plan, you have a great idea. Who? I have a great idea. Woo! And you then do something to implement that idea. Take action. You're starting to, you know, paint or uh, start doing things. And what happens that instead of, you know, taking three months, something starts to happen. His wife also told me that uh, that's a great idea. <laughs> I guess it's always helpful having a wife. But the thing here is when you're taking action, you're implementing things in the physical world. And a lot of people believe that you know you need talent or hard work. Talent works depending on what area we're talking about. Talent is about what people call you know, something called deep practice. Deep practice, it's uh, made uh, in a book called The Talent Code. Talent Code book by David Coyle. And you can look it up if you want to. And, it, uh, and the thing here with uh, that is that to show this, that if you spend, let's say, 50 hours a week, doing something that's challenging a little beyond your capability 
it means that it's a little, little it's, it's challenge your uh, current level of uh, skill so you go just beyond it so let's say your skill is like this right so then you have to implement this deep practice so you're starting to add deep practice so you're focusing on to make uh, a specific if you're playing the violin or guitar or something like that or to implement uh, uh, a deep practice to, to improve your skill to do a particular piece of music for example uh, perfect and that means you have to focus focus a lot more so the, the period you focus on on this skill level raises your skill by uh, a lot and uh, we, when we're talking there is uh, some people who uh, call it 10,000 hour rule and some Anders Eriksson is a Swedish professor said that you need 10,000 hours to get to you know expert level of the art that's not true you need a strategy that define the skill or skill or result if you have that it doesn't take you 10,000 hours he's wrong about that by the way but that's how people do it normally if you do it like you know, most people do things in this it will take you around 10 there is a guy out there who practice golf the damn plan he using the Anders Ericsson proverb to, to make the 10,000 hours to become a PGA Tour Pro He's been doing it for, I don't know, two years, three years soon. And it's about two and a half, three thousand hours, something like that, I don't know. You need hours, you need to put in the hours, obviously. But you also need to implement a good plan, and that means a good strategy. And to take action, obviously. And then you also need to have feedback. So when you're doing this deep practice stuff, you're able to increase the skill and if you spend, let's say, 50 hours a week to practice your skill, it means in, in this, uh, those people who are experts in the field or really, really good, spent about 25 hours of those 50 hours in deep practice. So those guys spend 25 hours. Those who are, let's say, average or something like that, they maybe spend five hours or three hours in deep, doing deep practice. And that's the main difference in skill level increasing. Now, that's deep practice. So if you combine deep practice and challenge your skill level, and then you add a strategy that allows you to be more uh, faster or efficient, let's call it efficient. That means that you can increase your skill level a lot faster and become more skilled in the, in the time frame that's not just 10,000 hours. So you can prove that wrong uh, in many ways because if you have a uh, superior strategy, superior, that means that you can, if you understand that the, defini the definition of the field you're going to do, whatever that might be, it allows you to cut a lot of time from that 10,000 hours. Now, you still need time. I mean, if you implement a strategy or whatever it might be, right, to something, to do something, it will take you some time, X time, say, we'll say it X time, to get to a level of skill where, where you're happy with it, obviously. Uh, it will go a lot faster if you have a good plan or strategy when you start planning or doing things or taking the action. The question is, when you do this, uh, how do you know that the strategy you're going to use is more effective or better than some other plan or strategy someone, uh, somebody else is doing? And there's a lot of confusion uh, in the fields of um, training and sport and performance about that. What I'm doing with RBIM is I took uh, Hans Andersson, he's, he's a golf pro. So I took him for four hours and I implemented a teaching strategy in golf, uh, in the golf swing. 
So it took him four hours to increase the speed by 10-15 miles per hour while he's doing it more straight. I also taught him uh, the, the way to teach him this way so it will be increased increased skill level improvement over time that because I'm implementing a superior strategy for him so he can discover for himself how his body is made to move within the swing system and I also took care of uh, the when he differentiates or creating discrepancy as you like to say when it's not a match so he knows what to do when it doesn't work for some reason when he's people in the swing system and golf always talk about consistency but you can't do it so i'm implementing a way to make him more consistent that means if you spend this x time practicing the skill level he will increase that far beyond what people normally say people say it takes two years to change the golf swing and the way I do it, it doesn't take that long. It takes a little bit more than four hours, definitely. But um, let's say three months, three weeks to three months, something like that. Then you can change it and have it and play with it. Because I'm bypassing what people normally do within the skill set. And I do that by... And when I talk about golf, I talk about the motion. And people say, what's about the technique then? So they talk, want to talk about the technique. And I say, it doesn't matter. I don't care about the technique. I'm only concerned about the motion that matches the ideal in this case. I mean, you can do it that way. Now, when you implement this kind of stuff, in NLP, it's called modeling. Uh, it's a skill level of modeling. And modeling means that you study someone who is doing things uh, really great. Uh, you can call it... Uh, excellence so that means that, uh, whatever you're doing when you study is excellent the NLP made an assumption when they studied for example people in uh, therapy they actually knew what they were doing that uh, Milton H. Eric Milton was a great guy so uh, NLP patterns of change change patterns is based on the problem the big focus on NLP and the change work is so. what, what I did when I started um, in this case uh, just a radius work and in, in, in that it's uh, some guy called Roy, called Roy Fraser what Roy discovered was that if we elicit in this case a future memory He didn't say it that way, but if you do that, if you listen to the future memory containing the experience you want to have, being happy, for example, or in the flow, or something like that, right? And if you access that through what we call a vestibular or action, called RBIM, we have a strategy for that. That means you can elicit the future experience already there. Now, if you apply that kind of future experience, and learning the skill before you do it you're bypassing all this 10,000 hour rule because you will implement a more efficient way of learning the skill and task or school education whatever it is for example in law school they have a strategy that if you have a case right you look up all their cases that means if you have a, a burglar who, is did, who, who did some break-in and if you want to create a defense for that, you look up all the cases where other burglars have been doing this and been acquitted or have a case reference. That's what they should teach you day one in law school, but they don't teach you. It takes them one year to implement this kind of strategy instead of, let's say, one week or two weeks. So if, let's say you can implement that kind of strategy in two weeks instead of one year. You have this kind of strategy, and it takes you two weeks to learn to do it, instead of one year in school. Now, it's not like it's 52 weeks in school or, or a year, but you can imagine that instead of spending one year learning 
this kind of strategy you, you learn it in the first two weeks then you can implement a lot of other things in there so then it becomes what we call an organization issue or uh, logistic and this plans back to the you know start of excellence so if you want to be more efficient or have a better performance curve you want to have greater feedback but you also need to implement this kind of future memory experience in advance before you're learning the skill and you also need to define it that's what I'm really good at in my line of work people in NLP have no clue about uh, do things in the RBM way and because when you start doing things in the RBM way you know what people call a problem doesn't matter anymore because it's, it's I had I had students. Uh, I asked them, "Do you have a problem?" Right? And some students said, "Yeah, I have one." And they talked about that, right? And described it and all that stuff. And after five minutes, when I've been talking to them, the problem they had doesn't exist anymore. So it's not a problem anymore. And people go, "What's going on?" Well, I, the thing with memory is that you need to constantly re recall the memory and if you recall it enough times the encode the encoding in the brain changes so that means if you recall it enough times like that something uh, funny happens that you are actually remembering the memory differently Or and all and also you remember it differently, but also you remember it better. And there is a, some guy who done the meme thing. Uh, he tested how long between the events do you need to um, recall the, the things you want to remember. A lot of people go to school, and you can take a doctor, and you can take a test in their uh, education if you have a doctor's education you go back and take one of those tests that today's uh, doctors are going through the school and all that you take that test give it to a doctor in the field who's you know you go there you have a chest pains or stomach ache or in pain in your shoulder whatever you go to the doctor take the test with you and give them the test before they can examine you right before they can examine you Examine you before that. Now, what happens? Well, they will most likely fail the test because they can't recall and remember the things they need to do to 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 complete the test. So the test is only uh, a way of confirming during the education that they can remember the information they are taught in the test, but they can't recall it after in the school uh, or in the field. They can't remember it in the field. And if you can't recall the information in the field, why are people doing tests then? In the, in the school. I don't understand that because it doesn't make sense for me. And some people say, well, you have to do the test so they can confirm that they actually do th know things about school and remember. And I said, well, that's a bad way to teach people because if you do make them the test in the school and they can't recall the information when they are a doctor, what good is the test for? And if you look at any field, they will show you that the doctor, when they don't know what they need to know, they ask a colleague or they look it up in a book or they run some tests. So the strategy or efficiency of being a doctor is about, you know, what to do when someone has symptoms of some kind. So if you teach people all this kind of different symptoms about chest area, stomach area, and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, first, in the doctor's education, you can cut down five years of education to two years, something like that. Because you have a better efficient strategy. And you make a better doctor because they're doing the things people do already in the field. So that's what you can use modeling to, to do. And so say people say, if you have a better efficient strategy as a doctor, are you more talented then? And this is, comes down to when people talk about talent, it's basically a lot of work becoming better. Talent, do work, but in this case, smart work. 
So you have a plan and a strategy. And you have a feedback loop obviously in that. You have a feedback loop here. So you have some kind of feedback loop going back, building the skill. And you do a lot of deep practice. So that means when you do the deep practice, you implement the deep practice within the strategy that people already use to be efficient in the field. And this is what I've been doing in the golf swings field. What I've been doing in the golf field, uh, I, I, I can show you some examples. I defined how a dis, what the dyslexic, uh, what dyslexia is and what to do about it. And you can work with uh, in this in the school system if you want what you do with, with this dyslexic, because I define this is critical. I define what the dyslexic lacks and what they need to be learning. So you can organize people in the school field in that way. I also define NLP because you, people talk about the process in NLP, and they have no idea what that is. I define that also. I taught it in my NLP education. No one else, so, no, no Richard Bannon, John Grinder, Jose Brigio, Robert Diltz, David Gordon, Jose Lozier, uh, you name the name, uh, they can't do it, they can't teach it. They have to go to my class first to, to learn that. And some of my students can recall that and do that, and most of them, when you ask them, they have no idea, but they can do it. Um, because they don't understand it, it's a high level skill and I also define the goal swing which I'm I three years ago I decided to you know apply what I'm doing with the RBM to goal swing because I assumed that the people in the golf field knew what they were doing but I found out there was a big mess in the golf swing and the golf swing game and all that stuff so uh, I modeled and studied the golf swing and defined it so yeah, I'm able to teach it in a different way. So I'm, I'm looking at the motion here. So if you apply the motion and learning some of the basic things I'm teaching on my website, you can create a good feedback loop here. So you can implement and get the result much faster than people do uh, in normal uh, ways in the golf swing. So normally people say in the golf year it takes two years two years to implement the swing change to, to be able to play with it and I say anything else than three months you're doing something wrong so something between three weeks and three months it should long enough it shouldn't take you know to implement the swing change you can play with it and the thing here is what I'm asking people why do people when they go to a golf trainer get worse they get Worse. Why? Why do the people who go to a golf swing training get worse? Why don't they get better? I can't understand that. Until I understood uh, the, the reason why they get worse is they can't do what I'm doing. Whenever I'm teaching people, they get better. They get better. And that means they hit longer. Uh, they hit more accurate, more straight, and all that stuff. And it's easier. All that stuff. When I'm teaching people, they get better from the bat. I implemented this strategy for uh, any swing system. And uh, when I was teaching Hans, when he was doing this old swing system, I increased his uh, distance with the driver 50 yards. Took me 10 minutes. And he's increased his, his swing and, uh, uh, with 50 yards. That's what I can do with this kind of, you know, competence and skill I have about the human brain and behavior. The thing here is, do you need talent for all this, what I've been describing? I've been working for about soon 20 years. I've spent 20 years studying human behavior and human brain. So we have a brain here. 
I've been studying this and the action people do when they are, you know, doing things with the body, stuff like that. Some neck care and stuff like that. So I've been studying and doing this kind of thing for 20 years and, and I'm asking myself uh, when I was doing NLP why the NLP could do things because uh, when I ex examined the NLP field there was a lot of discrepancy there also but they had, when I started asking questions about it they couldn't answer me so since they couldn't answer my question I had to define and search for the answer. So the question is do you need talent? Well the question is what is talent? It's obviously some people m might be bad than other people, but the question is that I work with kids. This is the funny thing. I work with kids who have a speech issue. I met this girl, she was 11 years old. She couldn't speak properly, but she was, she was you know, and I had other kids also with speech issues. They have been, she'd been since she was four years old. To Alava. She had a lot of uh, people trying to help her sp speak more properly. In the, there are educated people in the field who try to help her and all that. I made a two hour implementation of her and she started to speak perfectly after that. It took me two hours. Obviously, what I was doing was it's more effective than the educated field in that area. And I can teach people to do that. It takes some time, but when they start doing that, you can see results in hours instead of years. Now, the same thing here is then people say, well, you are more talented. Than I no, I just understand what you need to do to make people speak better. I had this boy who was, uh, had a Polish, she was from Poland. Her mother was, his mother was from Poland. So he implemented the same way there, and he started to speak better. The funny thing also, his mother started to speak a little bit better Swedish. On the road. She'd been living in Sweden for 20 years. So obviously people don't understand how to improve that kind of thing. But do you make me talented? Well, I spent 20 years learning to do all those things. And I paid attention. The thing is with skill, is that when you're starting to do something with a skill, you ask yourself, what is the future end result? So if you're going to do something, what's the future? Uh, because it's new, it's a new reality here. But most people just daydream because they don't do things, they don't take action. When you start to take action, and for some reason it doesn't work, whatever you're doing, you then implement some kind of efficiency with the feedback. You need to take action, you get feedback, right? Kind of silly, right? And you start implementing some kind of uh, different action so you get to this reality then, right? The thing here is you can speed this process up by implementing a better plan which I define as a better strategy and definition of the area. You see, in every field they do things they do not know or understand they're doing because it's so obvious for them to do things. In the speech impairment, you have to uh, coordinate about uh, another color so it's easier to see for you to see. Let's say you have 11 muscles in your throat, dear, uh, diaphragm, and all that stuff. You have different 11 muscles to speak. Properly, you have to uh, diaphragm, you have to coordinate, you have uh, muscles to coordinate. You can speak a little bit differently if you would like to. If you can speak a little bit different. So you have some, but when people have a lack of skill, they can't do it. They have a speech impairment. So they can't speak like uh, what I'm speaking like or not in my Swedish English. You ask yourself, well, how do you teach someone who doesn't know? That's the key. If people come to me and ask, you know, Robert, I like this RBI, I want to learn it, cool, then do it. Uh, but I want to understand it to say, well, if you're doing RBIM, you apply RBIM to learn RBIM.
So if you're going to learn this, you first use you apply it to learn it. And people go, what do you mean by that? Well, you're using the technology itself to learn to learn the technology you are going to learn. And people go, you can't do that. And I say, well, I can teach you that. But most people think they have to learn something, the information here, and then when they have learned that, then they can really learn RBIM. And that doesn't make sense for me because if you need information, which most people are, I want some information about RBIM, cool. Well, first you elicit the future memory about already learning it. Future learning, memory. And people told, tell me, you know, I don't understand that. Well, you're always using future memories anyway. The next dinner you're making is in the future. And people say, uh, well, I don't think it's in the future because it's, it's something I know uh, that uh, I'm going to make meatballs in the afternoon. That's already settled. I say, well, that's a future memory now. But most people don't think about that as a future memory. And I say, why not? Well, it's, you know, I've done it before. No, I said, if you create a future memory, you can create it in any way you want it, so you have already done it. You obviously have to be careful so you don't, you know, end up uh, really not or crazy. Because you don't know what's real and what's not real. You have to know what's real. So you get not get nothing. That's one of the concerns. But you apply it when you're going to learn this, you use it to learn it. And then you implement, you know, uh, action. Whoa, cool. Action. And a plan. Because the plan is then, you know, applying that. And then you m measure the feedback, obviously. And, so, and suddenly you understand that you're already implementing RBIM in your own. So you increase the learning curve here. So you, you, this, the, the increased learning curve is, is now compressed and it's made faster because you have a better efficient strategy to learn it. So instead of going through the information phase and you know convince yourself that you already learned or know en enough and then implement it and then try to learn it, that's uh, engage what people call uh, uh, doubt, worry, uh, pretty much everything you have learned to do in your life up to the point, and that's past reference. And it's totally unneeded. So when people tell me they don't have a talent or lucky enough and all of that, I can always prove them wrong because when they start to do it my way, which I'm going to teach them, they get a, a lot more skilled, a, a lot faster than they even deem possible. A lot of people don't like that because they've been told by people that, you know, uh, reality doesn't work that way, the society doesn't work, or, you know, life doesn't work that way. Uh, because that's the way I'm, in the dyslexic field, for example, this was a bit longer than I was expected. In any science, in any science, whatever it be, dyslexic or in any other field, they have a model of understanding how they do things. Model, it's a conceptual model. Conceptual model. So that means that the field in the dyslexic area, for example, in dyslexia, They assume that, whatever, because this is really funny, in the dyslexic field, they can't fix it. They can't fix or help, whatever you call it, assist. If you are dyslexic there, you can't help them. That's the no-go. They can't do anything. Or whatever they're doing, it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't work. So when I could come in and talk to them and, you know, say that, with the thing I've been doing, and uh, we can help those who are dyslexic to learn them to read and spell and comprehend the material they're reading without issues. And it goes both fast, easy, and it's fun. That's really, really important also. So suddenly, I, I've taken people, or in this case, dyslexic, with a proven diagnosis. This is important. 
that have been diagnosed by the people of the science in the field. They have diagnosed dyslexia. And for them in the field, it's never going to happen that they are going to read and spell and comprehend information normally again. They are now diagnosed and they are screwed for life. That's what they believe and understand in the world of science of dyslexia. I had those dyslexic diagnosis and all that implement what I'm doing and they are now reading and spelling and comprehending just fine. And those, uh, I, uh, one of my colleagues took one of those who had diagnosis and implemented this. The, the girl in this case went back to the same place who made this diagnosis and they asked her why she was doing this test because she was reading, spelling, comprehending just fine now. And she told them, in the science in this field, that she was diagnosed dyslexic from them and they didn't believe her. Because she didn't, you know, wasn't dyslexic anymore. And she, she wasn't dyslexic, the diagnosis didn't apply anymore. But the same place who made the diagnosis and of her, her dyslexia could not implement the diagnosis anymore because she was reading spelling normal like everybody else was doing. Is doing. And the people in the science field of uh, dyslexia can't believe it and can't understand it because they can't do it. And if you can't do it in the same way I was talking about here earlier, if you have information learning, you can't do RBM, for example, so you're thinking about the past up worries and all that stuff. So you're looking for more information. And I say, use RBM to learn RBM, I say. So I'm backtracking. Because I've been doing this for 20 years now, right? And uh, using feedback loop and deep practice and all that stuff. Because encoding on and recalling and all this of memory is what the past is teaching us. So if you're recalling past events all the time, that's what the brain goes, oh, this is what I should do more of. So the brain starts doing more of that and connect the dots like that. And if you ask yourself, what do we want to remember? Do we want to remember everything that you know goes to shit? like in the past, or can we create future, happier moments of our life and have a different kind of experience and view of the world where our reality works the way we want it to work, so where we have enough talent suddenly because we have a, a better strategy to elicit and work with when we're learning the logistic or whatever it's going, instead of taking one year to learn something in the school, take it two weeks, then we can learn other things more efficiently. And the deep practice there helps because you're going to focus on a specific set, making it perfect. And, uh, and that produces a very focused attention span. So you can, and it uh, requires some focusing. And things that like that can happen. And I recommend the Talent Code by David Cohen. It's a good book. And uh, he, he studied and looked at people all over from tennis and stuff like that. And what I'm using in RBM and doing most is uh, implementing a, a more efficient strategy that I define that helps you increase the skill and result much, much faster than the 10,000 hour rule. A lot of people believe in that. It's, not, it's, it's true if, if you do it the way people normally do it. But if you do it my way, you can cut that out for a lot. So, we, so the question was from the start here. Do you need talent? or hard work. Well, you, you can say that you need uh, perseverance. You need to stick with it. You stay with it. But you also need to be smart about it. So you, you can't just stick with the plan of making action if the plan sucks. So you have to use the feedback to understand that do I uh, increase my skill level and do I get uh, better to do whatever I want to happen as an experience when I'm having in the future? And uh, as, my, as my student was, you know, renovating and decorating his home, he was thinking about it a lot. This is about the information gathering people do a lot. This is the information phase. People like to collect information because they, they, they believe, people come to believe if they have more information, they get rich. 
or successful or happy. And I got to tell you one thing. Uh, if you believe this, that the more information believe you to get more happy, rich and successful, all that stuff, I will tell you this, that's pure bullshit. Right here, right now. That's pure bullshit. You can quote me on that. Now, you need some information, obviously, but if you need to information, more information, information, you're never going to get anywhere. It will make people feel better about the, whatever they feel better. Because a lot of people don't realize that, but our brain is basically doing two things at the same time. This is the key uh, to understand human behavior, if you like, if you ask me. The human brain is trying to do two things at the same time. It wants to have a comfort zone and since the brain is always working with duality that's why you're always talking to yourself like I like to say talk to yourself that's the duality of man that's because the brain is doing that through evolution So we ask ourselves in what I'm doing here. So what happens if we want to have a comfort zone? What happens in our duality then? Well, the brain is always creating scenario of the future because that's the latest addition in our evolution of you know cognitive mind and all that stuff. So when we talk about people who are thinking about you know I need talent and all that, they want to be in the comfort zone because they're feeling comfortable by the need to have talent. Because since they don't have talent, they don't need to do in the future. But the brain is always creating scenarios so they can daydream or doing something like that. Uh, and a lot of people live in an illusion now. This creates an illusion that in more information, that more information, more information leads to, you know, this future scenario and daydream. It might happen like that, but it's not likely. Because uh, we need to connect to some way of action, in this case of behavior. That's what action is, it's behavior. And thinking like this is also behavior. So we need a behavior that allows us to be with feedback get us where we want to be and I won't go through that because I cover enough here with this but you have to understand that this more information that you need talent to be in your comfort zone is it, the brain is trying to constantly to be in the comfort zone and also to create a scenario of the future because that's what we're doing and a lot of people uh, never really examine their ambition or motives and values and all that stuff for, for, for this kind of action. This is what people do. I get a client, for example, that tell me, you know, I want to be happy, they say. Yeah, okay, cool. So, how come you're not that? Well, and they will address this comfort zone because I, you know, try to be happy. Maybe my mom gets upset or my, I have a traumatic past or I have some, you know, bad things in my, you know, in my past here. And they project that into the future, obviously, right? And I go like, so I'm creating an illicit system, the future scenario. What's happening when you're really happening? And I'm using RBM then to elicit that. So they have a new experience sooner or later. And when they have this new future experience, when they are happy, all this past stuff doesn't, or the comfort zone doesn't exist in the same way anymore because they have this kind of experience. And they have a new behavior with feedback and how they want to be. So, it all, you know, goes back to the encoding of the memory, again. So if you create the future memory back to yourself, in this case, what happens is sooner or later this new memory becomes solid enough to you to use in your experience. And this creates, you know, because of the connection of memory, or recalling or encoding of memory. So you recall and encode memory all the time.
And the things is what do you want to remember that? All the shit or building a new future memory that you know contains the best of you. The best the best of you. So when people tell me, you know, I need talent, I say, no, you know, you need a smart plan. We had a good strategy. That's the definition of behavior in the area. Stuff like that. You know, you can do it in so many ways. But most people, when they start to implement an action plan, I was mentioning the damn plan before. It's a guy who's trying to become a PGI tour pro. And he's, uh, he started to get stuck in the technique level also. And you have to ask yourself, why do people do that? Why do they get stuck in the technique? Because when the technique sounds, you know, and feels like it's more comfort. You can talk about that without feeling stupid or something like that because you can relate it to the technique and where is this going to help is going to be instead of implementing a more superior strategy where you can learn to swing the golf club in a few days or a few hours or a few weeks if you implement the way I teach people to do that and it's, it's not that comfortable because what I elicit the future experience and future memory where it already has happened that creates the comfort of that. When one start, people start doing the things I'm teaching, all this other stuff people do is collecting information. It just doesn't make sense anymore. And a lot of people who do this find out after a while that the talented, the talent they talk about or and the thought they had or not have doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't make sense anymore. Instead of being thinking about uh, you need to have talent, they're doing a lot of hard and smart work. And sticking with it so they can you know get some have some action whatever you call it um, and it, this challenge a lot of uh, assumptions people have about talent it changes a lot of uh, uh, assumption about skill level increase and how long it's going to take and all that and this just not I've been doing this for with dyslexia golf and MLP there's a lot of other fields of you can apply this I mean all in search or finding diamonds in the world or you know going to uh, out in the universe with the uh, spaceships and increasing fuel efficiency in uh, cars uh, I mean uh, when people have this comfort thing in the in, uh, li like a lifestyle people say oh I have this lifestyle when I need to have this car uh, or apartment when you building people building apartments nowadays when you build an apartment like like let's say you have 40 feet for one room uh, you can have either one room or one apartment with the same and you can plan the apartment differently than in the room obviously you can actually utilize the space differently and if you know, I talk about space people say oh that's RBIM and I go yes you can utilize the different. When I move to my apartment, it's uh, uh, it's one. It's made for one individual to live in. But actually, I can probably have five people living here, and I still will have plenty of room for myself. That's how big one apartment is for me. And because when you start building new apartments, you can build a house that, and they, you know, let's say we want to build a hundred new apartments. This is about talent also. So, in the same house, you can build a few hundred new apartment the way the, the, the design works now. Right? Let's say we implement a new strategy there, a new plan. So, we, we build more apartments that are smaller. So, instead of having 100 now, we have maybe 250 new apartments in the same house. Same space, the building. But since there are now uh, 250, you have just increased the building cost to, inc to include 150 more apartments. So the cost is the same, X, same, basically, for building one house, big one, big house, one big house. The cost is still the same. That, that, that doesn't change much. But you have now 150 more apartments in the same house. 
So if, let's say I wanted to build this kind of a house. Hmm. And I get building in the right area, obviously. Then I get, can get 150 more people paying me. And I can l make less rent for, for this house. So you get, you get, you pay less for it. You, it gets cheaper to live in. But since you get cheaper to rent in and you still have 150 more apartment tenancy to pay you, you make more money. You make more money, still pay the same for this, and the who lives there pays less. Everybody wins. This is a win-win situation. And some people say, do you, do you really expect people to live in a smaller apartment than uh, they are used to? Or what other people uh, you know offer, and I will tell you if you if I design this kind of house, where I can have 150 more apartments in, instead of 100 or 10. If you're building a house with, let's say, 10 apartments, and I build a house, it's the same house I have 25. Yes, I could do that, and I can make people live there because it's all about the plan design. So when people talk about talent and logistic and comfort zone this is what people do. they assume that people need this kind of space to live in and when you ask someone how much space they need uh, they don't need that much space and since the living cost is uh, rent and all that's pretty high especially in our country uh, this kind of implementation would be not that hard to do and it will be win-win both for the consumer and the producer I, I don't understand why people don't do this personally and now that was enough for me, and and me is, if you don't know that, is Robert, and it was, this was a long tape again, I like to talk, sorry about that. My name is Robert, and I'm the developer of RB, I am. It's a kick-ass system that replaces NLP and everything else in psychology, uh, and it has wider implications all over the world, and if you want to know more, you got to talk to me, man, or girl or alien, whatever, whoever you are, call me.